Good morning and well, welcome to Digitalist webinar. Um, today we are talking about how to keep the co-creation flame on. Um, I think we have two angles here today to discuss. One is um, looking at uh, user collaboration and user involvement uh, throughout the design process using uh, digital tools. Um, and the other aspect that we are covering uh, with a colleague of mine is how to run and 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 um, lead remote workshops um, as all the sticky notes and the and the and the workshop pencils are now uh, hidden away and we can't really use them uh, for face-to-face -face get togethers um, and obviously we need to innovate and keep innovating around around these challenges um, and, and we'll discuss some of our um, experiences on remote collaboration. Um, my name is Villa Osterlund, and I'm the Lean Lab practice lead. So I'll, I'll cover Lean Lab today, which is our co creation platform for end users. Um, and then I'll have my colleague Jenny Newman, our design lead. Uh, talking about remote workshops, uh, the tips around there, and how to kind of combine the user research and the remote workshops together. Before we launch into these topics today, um, I like to discuss, uh, discuss a little bit um, why we are doing this, and I think I, I, I know that many have seen this uh, DMI value index. And it basically shows that the design-centric companies uh, far outperform uh, the S&P 500 index. Um, but I think the more interesting is that those companies are sort of champions in design thinking, the likes of uh, Apple, Ford, IBM, Nike, Procter & Gamble, and so on, that are listed there on the slide. Um, but most interesting is to kind of discuss the characteristics of those uh, design-centric companies. I think what kind of unites them is is that they all are connecting with with people, with their employees, with with the society. So they're always in sync. What's happening around them? Um, also, the quality of their solutions that they 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 put, whether it's products or services or or, or a combination, are always top-notch because they tend to involve users in the process. Uh, and they have a holistic think, think kind of process uh, as they develop new services and experiences. Um, their operations um, are also characterized um, by design thinking. So they look at their operations through the lens of end users and customers and, and thereby fine tune their um, processes um, accordingly. And they are all, all obviously innovators in their own category um, and with innovation they can then um, stand out from the other brands they can um, differentiate themselves build loyalty and justify higher premiums um, and, and when thinking about kind of those characteristics um, i think one angle particularly which is the sort of focus for for our webinar today is um, to look at the kind of user involvement uh, in the design process and a, a typical sort of design process um, may look a little bit like here on the left side of the screen um, where we are designing for the user but not with the user actually um, and it's it's sort of characterized by that there is a hypothesis for for the business case um, the, uh, if it's a digital uh, innovation that, that the company is working on, uh, they tend to be fully specced out. They tend to look a little bit, more, a little bit like waterfall type processes. Um, and there might be some ideation at the very early stage, uh, looking at the different hypotheses and getting um, the internal stakeholders uh, 
kind of involved in the process, there's very little end user involvement and quite quickly it launches into the development of the, the products or a service. Um, and, and, and what's sort of fun, fun, fun about this is that it's also characterized by that these programs that are, are developed here on the left side of the screen are, are the ones that cannot fail. That's what I hear often from, from customers who are sort of following this type of process. Um, because there's so much investment on the back of these projects and programs, you know, it must succeed when the service launches. But obviously when the service launches, you know, the hypothesis in the beginning hasn't been thoroughly tested and experimented, which then often leads to a, a launch failure. Um, and in fact, is it around about 90, 80, 90% of the product launches fail. And one kind of large, um, a reason around that is, is that there is a lack of user involvement. And then if we look at the, the right side of the screen, that's co-creation with user. And, and the idea there is that the, the, the whole process is agile. Um, you don't spec out upfront what you're actually looking to develop. You're actually delaying your development invest, investments as far as you can, so that before you make that commitment, you, you ensure that there is market fit and you fully understand the end users and, 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 and their jobs to be done and so on. And only then you start creating experiments, concepts, and even then you're not fully developing them into fully functional experiences or products, but you're actually trying to build mock-ups or create experiences which you can run manually through experiments. And it's only through that process that you then develop the final um, experience and the product. And then when you launch into the market, you have not just your people behind um, for the product launch, but also your end customers. And you're far more likely to succeed with the service, with this style of co-creation. Now, um, let's look at how this is actually done um, uh, across businesses, how do we bring users on board for the co-creation for the service development process? And what I'd like to discuss today is one of our digitalist innovations called Lean Lab, which is essentially a platform and a methodology to integrate the user voice into the design process. It's a web-based platform. Uh, that allows us to connect and co-create with end users, but also with employees. So we're using it for both courses. And of course, depending on the innovation challenge that we are looking at. And originally Lean Lab was born out from, um, from the need to, to be able to connect very closely with end users and iterate with them uh, over greater distances, looking at global product innovations, um, innovations where you have multiple um, end user groups that ha are characterized by different behaviors and so on. So you need to pull those different um, end users together to fully understand the full picture of what you're looking at. And that's how Lean Lab came about. It's also um, fully digital so people can participate it in the process. Uh, through the comfort of their own home sofa or, or um, home office environment. Um, and it's fully secure, of course, as a lot of the innovation is happening on that digital platform. Um, and to facilitate that dialogue, we have different types of tools and methods there. I won't go too much into detail there today, um, but uh, we are having discussions and surveys and photo galleries and everything that we can we can um, tap into the end user and, and, and make the end user to show um, their side of the, the, the coin or the table uh, to share their experiences with us, with designers. Um, and when placed smartly or, or correctly, I would say that, that, that this type of uh, approach really serves the entire business looking at uh, product innovation teams, looking at brand and communications, 
We also do a fair amount uh, across digital channels, helping companies to scale up um, their digital operations and looking at the customer experience throughout uh, the digital journeys, uh, as well as service delivery, service teams, and so on. So everyone can kind of get their piece of action from Lean Lab because on a binary level, what's, what it's all about is that you actually have your end users and then you can co-create with your end users across uh, your business. And if you look at it from the kind of double diamond um, design process point of view, it also enables and allows you to connect with your end users throughout the design process. So it's not just, um, let's say, hypothesis testing that you can do with, with, uh, with Lean Lab, uh, or it's not just the validation, but it's the whole process where you can get your users involved throughout the discovery when you are working out the consumer journeys or the end-to-end -end journeys, throughout the design process when you're designing new mock-ups, uh, new experiences, you can test them with, with Lean Lab, get the users involved, uh, ask them to mystery shop competing products and services and so on. And then when you actually go into the kind of development phase, you can then keep the users in a close loop with the development and, and help you to, to launch a service or a product in the market that, that um, um, is, is, is delivering on the user needs. Just briefly on how, how do we usually set up Lean Labs for, for our clients. First of all, um, I think the, the key is, is to figure out whether it's something that you're looking to do maybe on the short term or whether this is a sort of a longer term kind of a strategic move for your business to, to start integrating user voice into the business across the different teams. So then we are looking at, you know, short term programs or longer term programs. Uh, short term programs are, let's say, pinpointed needs to, to launch a new service or a product and a longer term um, program may look a little bit uh, like what I've discussed later with, uh, with the case study of Finair, where they are using customer community uh, through the business uh, over long periods, periods of time to be collaborating with the end users. Um, then we do the community setup and branding. Uh, so it can be branded to your, your um, you know, brand guidelines and so on. So it will look like it's yours, which is important because in a lot of the, the communities that we run for our clients, they are in a, in a sort of a close relationship with the actual end users. Uh, the community numbers, that's, uh, um, it, it varies again, depending on the program. So, so we have communities where uh, we have only like 100 participants, depending again on the, um, on the customer base or, or uh, the, the innovation challenge in question, and all the way up to 10,000 or more members can be um, joining on the Lean Lab program. And then what's critical about running Lean Lab is that it, it needs to be a systematic uh, process. So, so we then introduce a sort of a systematic approach uh, where we do either weekly or monthly cycles together with, with our customers so that, so that the, the customers are, are involved across the teams, uh, across different business units, um, and to take part in the Lean Lab action. And then, you know, we, we either do it as a full service solution, so we do all the planning, all the activities, uh, all the kind of workshops and the results uh, on, on client's behalf, or there is a DIY option, which then means that you can run uh, your own customer community using the Lean Lab um, DIY tools. Right. Um, and I think before we look at kind of use cases, how you might use Lean Lab and how our customers are using it, I think there are like four um, key takeaways or benefits when you're looking at kind of digital customer co-creation uh, on, on a platform like Lean Lab. Uh, first of all, I think it allows you to learn faster than your peers 
um, because you are in a constant touch and sync with your end users uh, uh, and, and through that kind of sort of a horizontal uh, experience that you're building up you learn so much about your users how they interact with your services and products which you can then utilize in your own innovation process so so you just become smarter as a business um, it also enables you to move away from the kind of um, shooting in the dark uh, developing products and services that no one needs and go into the kind of more co-creation with users and, and helps you to spend wisely which means that you can delay the investments that you're doing for your digital products and services or physical services in fact uh, you can use it for both uh, purposes uh, and then only make investments once you know that the market fit is there and you fully understand the user needs and, and, and their reactions to, to the concept that you're working on. And what I really like about Lean Lab um, as well is that it, it gives you a sort of a constant 360 loop with your end users. So you have no more unanswered questions. Uh, so you can ask first uh, and shoot then, uh, which is sort of a quite drastic change for, for for many companies, the way they innovate. Um, and when we ask from, from our kind of end users who are participating in Lean Lab programs, 90% uh, of those customers want more. So they wanna be part of this process. They wanna be part of the brand. They wanna help brands to develop new services, new products and, and experiences. So it's very relevant uh, when you think about the current times and, and, and the way um, uh, people, customers are looking to, to connect with, with your brand. Right, let's look at briefly the, the use cases before I, I go into the Finair case study, which I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, I think, first of all, uh, you can use Lean Lab to kind of capture your existing CX experiences and develop those in a very close relationship and uh, with, with your end users. So, so here you can use, you know, um, diary type exercises to ask people to keep a diary on, on their shopping experience or as they are looking at, let's say, different insurance products or, or, uh, or different services. Uh, you can kind of be the fly on the wall and, and see how, how their experiences evolve, not just with you, but also with perhaps with competing brands as well. Um, and kind of collect that insights uh, on board and utilize it in your own um, CX innovation process. Um, you can capture images through the image galleries, so you can actually look at how people are using the service or the products in the home environment or or other environments, depending on who you are as a brand, what you are, what markets you are serving. Um, and of course, you can keep collecting feedback on the kind of key customer journeys and key features uh, using Lean Lab platform. And then you can ideate and improve the experiences. So you can kind of move beyond NPS measurement, which just gives you a static feedback. How did you do with this? You can actually improve and, 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 and kind of ask those questions, how uh, and why, how could I do it differently and improve? and develop different concepts, uh, which you can then test with your community. Uh, talking about concepts, uh, a fair amount of our clients are using it for, for innovation, um, product innovation, and it can be anything from physical uh, to digital products that we are innovating with. Um, and you can show them different concepts, ask to kind of give feedback. You can ask them to mystery shop, uh, competing existing services to kind of get ideas uh, for your concept development teams. Uh, you can understand the appeal of different designs, uh, different propositions, different pricing even. So there's a lot of different options that you can use um, Lean Lab for when you're developing concepts uh, and, and looking that perfect um, market fit. Um, a little bit later in the kind of design process, when you are actually preparing for launch, you can then ask people to beta your product. Uh, it can be again physical, 
where we send products to people uh, or it can be a, a digital kind of beta test type ex experience where we ask people to experience and, and use the, the, uh, the digital service for X period of time and then use the Lean Lab to collect the beta experiences uh, before you launch. And kind of going beyond uh, concepts and, and, and betas, then you can also use Lean Lab for capturing lead user thoughts, ideas, um, and, and use Lean Lab um, to kind of fuel your, your innovation, your future innovation pipeline by understanding who your customers are, building personas, um, you know, involving lead users to, in, in this example here we have, kind of a future of gaming type program going on where we are involving um, the lead users in the, in the gaming, gaming sector. Um, and then by involving lead users, we can then understand how it might um, transfer across to larger population over time and so on. So, so, so Lean Lab is a really versatile tool to be used, you know, the innovation that is at hand, you know, the next sort of, three to six months uh, and beyond to the next sort of three to five years even. Right, let's um, wrap up the Lean Lab section with a case study. Um, I've been working with, with Finnair for, uh, for a few years. Um, and and uh, when, when Finnair approached us, they, they, their sort of strategy was and it still is, is, is to sort of deliver unique Nordic experiences for the, the global um, uh, travel audiences, particularly the Europe and, and the Asia being the focus for them. And when they kind of started building this sort of air bridge between Europe and Asia, it became very apparent for them that, that they need to be involving with, with their uh, customers across different uh, cultures from Scandinavia to China and anything in between because they are delivering experiences to different uh, cultural sets and for that they needed to set up um, something like a community where they could um, innovate, hook up with their uh, customers on a regular basis and get them involved in different um, products and service development initiatives. So that's kind of how, how, how our journey began uh, with Finnair um, three years ago. And uh, we recruited um, just about a thousand customers um, uh, in, in four different kind of regions. So we have the Nordic region, we have the, the kind of European region, we have the, the Asian uh, region and passengers so that we are connecting with, with different uh, uh, groups um, simultaneously. And then it's a very systematic approach from there onwards. So once we have the community set up, uh, then it's a, it's a regular contact with these users uh, across the business. So, so Finner has been using it for anything between once a month to twice a month um, to connect and co-create with, with their um, passenger segments. And that's really critical so that it becomes uh, a sort of a process uh, adopted process within the business rather than sort of an uber process which no one owns. So that's really critical that there is a ownership in the business to, to make Lean Lab successful uh, for the business and, and, um, and help business to become more human friendly. Uh, just to give you a flavor on the kind of applications that Finner is using it for, um, um, one area, of course, is the, the, the kind of comms, marketing, and loyalty, which is, of course, a strong part of, of Finnair, kind of Finnair's program for their customer. And we've been helping with them across different um, communications and loyalty type concept um, projects uh, over the last uh, years. The, the middle section here is, of course, a great part of the, the, you know, how do you actually deliver that Nordic unique experiences, uh, how do you make it uh, real? And, and there we, we look at end-to-end -end customer journeys, uh, sometimes pinpointed activities like 
looking at lounge experiences or A350 onboard experience and so on, so that we get a full rich picture of what's happening uh, throughout the customer journey from start to finish. Um, and Finder is also using it for innovation, uh, new products and service innovation. So recently we've been involved with uh, a new uh, concept uh, called Door to Door, uh, which is essentially that from the same Finnair app, you can actually buy taxi tickets um, to the airport and to your destination. And again, it's part of Finnair's own kind of strategy to become more end-to-end -end, uh, company, uh, kind of enriching that travel experience from start to finish. And LeanLab has been going on for uh, about a decade, I would say. And, uh, and over the, the last five, six years, we've been uh, running more than 500 programs uh, for uh, 50 plus brands uh, across a uh, dozen of countries. So, so we have built up a lot of experience um, on how to involve end users to the process and, 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 and how companies can take the full benefit of something like Lean Lab collaboration platform. Um, that's it for me um, and on the Lean Lab and the end user uh, collaboration. I will now pass um, to my colleague Jenny Neumann um, and she's going to take you through um, how we are then running remote workshops and design sprints uh, using uh, remote and digital tools as as the face-to-face -face interaction is is now banned so she will share some experiences on that over to you Jenny great thank you Villa. okay so the next slide so my perspective of viewing this is uh, I usually lead the design in, in customer organizations or projects so I view it from a design perspective where uh, I'm the service designer and UX designer and how I can benefit from these different tools. So my experience of Lean Lab, for example, is it's a very good way to validate throughout the project if we're going in the right direction and, and use that community. But of course, we have different methodologies that we use. We do a lot of research, uh, workshops, design sprints, experiments, different kind of things where we involve the users and the stakeholders throughout the process. So one example of this is, for example, a project I was, I led the design team for a few years there where we had made the suomi.fi uh, website and all different uh, products related to that, where we had two different Lean Lab platforms, one for citizens with, and it continuously, it's going on still, though I'm not there anymore, and also one for internal stakeholders. So we had two different communities where we could gather information throughout the project. For, to get more info about the design and iterate them together with the users. But today I'm going to talk a bit more about actually remote workshopping and, and how to use different tools and what to take into account when you do and how to make sure that the experience for the participant is as good as possible. So what changes? So when we have like a physical uh, workshop, uh, it takes, it's a bit different. So when you go, Distance when you go like this remote, then the re workshop require more time because you need to take into account that people, we have to have like uh, breaks and time and you have to make sure that there's enough time to do all the exercises because the tools makes it a bit slower. But then again, when you go to a physical workshop, you have to take in time like for travel. We were for example talking with Ville here earlier how how we used to have, like when you have workshops, you have participants coming from Sweden, for example, to par participate here in Finland, how that affects the travel time. But when having a remote workshop, you can actually participate from different countries or very different locations and thus not lose time on travel, but actually the workshop then again takes a bit more time. Also, it takes a bit more time to plan the actual workshop because you need to be really well prepared for all exercises that you do throughout the workshop to make sure they run smoothly. But then again, you can spend less time on reporting since if you do the, use the tools, you already have all the information in a digital format. So reporting is really quick. Uh, also, there's less face-to-face -face video because as you, as you know, I have the video on at the moment, but I might close it off just because that affects often like how the sound travels and, and takes a lot of 
it affects the quality of the sound. And if we have a lot of participants with video on, of course, it will be more difficult to understand what the other one is saying if the connection is not good enough. So, but then again, there can be more participants and, and in that case. Then again, remote workshops has its challenges like technical challenges and other challenges that we, I will go through soon. But then again, it's very eco-friendly, it's ecological when you don't have to travel far away to go to the workshops. Then there are new tools you have to use, new costs, but then again, it's cost saving on travel, food and accommodation. So there are like various, it changes a bit, but then again, when you lose some, you get some in the other sense. So when you set up uh, your remote environment, you're probably gonna need a lot of different tools. Uh, for many, the tools are strange. Uh, from before for some it's more but especially for the participants they haven't used these tools previously so so it's a bit difficult but you might need a different tool for the sound to carry like we use now and then you might need a different tool for for example whiteboarding and when you choose what tool to use you have there are really fancy tools like Murala and Miro but they are very graphical tools and might be very difficult for a participant to use if they have never used graphical tools. For us designers they are quite easy to use but then again some participant that has never used a tool like this it might be difficult. So I still think that you should think that simple sim the simplest tool is usually the best tool. I use these when, when needed, but also I've used very simple tools. For example, if you have a workshop for a customer organization, you might just need a tool where several people can edit at the same time. So it might be like a Google Slides document, or it might be, for example, for my client, a confluence uh, area, which is a tool where you actually just write down stuff. So, so try to use a simple tool that is easy for the participants so that this isn't a hinder to participate in the actual workshop. And then you have different tools like these, like Zoom, for example, that supports uh, splitting up the group into smaller groups and so on. And we have different tools for, for how to make the sound travel, in a sense. So what changes? If you have a face-to-face -face workshop, uh, the, the ergonomics of how you, you spend the time, for example, in this picture, you see our, our uh, workshop area, which we have designed for the purpose of having big workshops. So we have a lot of sofas and nice places to sit and we, we facilitate the thing with having like snacks and, and drinks brought up and coffee and, and so everyone can easily relax and sit there. For example, if we have a design sprint workshop, we spend five days together, six hours a day. And it's made so, the area is made so that it feels nice to sit there all day, spend the time together. You can sit in small groups around small tables or you can sit in a sofa or like they here doing the picture, stand around the table. So you sort of change the position all the time and you move around and we sort of make sure that the experience is as easy as possible. But when you go to remote workshopping, for example, many days when I sit at home, I sit at my kitchen table and the table, the chair isn't very comfortable. So you sit there for a long hour. So you might perhaps go to your own sofa. But there's a lot of things and there's a lot of noise in the background. You might have your kids at home, as many of us currently do. So there's a lot of like stuff happening in the background. So it's not as easy to just jump into the workshop and concentrate on it fully and let the experience take you with you. So it changes a bit. So how to make it easier? Uh, for example, one way to do it is having splitting the day into different sort of sections. And this is also what makes the workshop take a bit longer time. But in the beginning, it's good to set time for getting to know the tools we're gonna use that day. If there are several tools, sort of making sure that the people find them, get to know them, understand them, so that that doesn't hinder throughout the day. And also you might have sections where you all work together. So you sit like this with all people talking together or then you might have parts where the people work alone on tasks. And thus building up the day with a lot of breaks in between like hourly breaks to make sure and so that people go and make their own snacks and so on. So this is really important to split up the day in several parts so that people can sort of, it's very rough to sit a long time listening to someone talking like this. So having the day split up in sections is much easier. Also, when the people arrive to our workshops, we of course make sure that they are sort of almost like, like taken to the hand and led throughout the workshop throughout the day. We can all the time make sure that they can continue working without any problem, like smoothly. Every group work that is done, we make sure that no one has in, like any issues that prevents them from actually continuing working. So we guide them throughout the workshop. So how does this change when you go to a remote workshop? Well, 
the thing that is very important is to have some way of communicating with all of them. An easy communication channel that is centered so that if, for example, you have several workshops throughout the project or you have different parts they have to participate, it doesn't change from place to place all the time. That you have one sort of centralized communication channel where you can set up everything and let them know, okay, now you have to do this and this, and if they have issues, they can contact you easily. So it's good to make sure that you know sort of what tools they are using currently, like in the organizations, can you use those like Teams, Flowduck, et cetera, Slack. Or if it's customers that are participating, like their customers, the users, end users, you can, for example, use Lean Lab for this. So this is a very good way. You can use Lean Lab in parts, if you have a workshop, you can have the tasks in Lean Lab, and thus it becomes like a central place for the participants to enjoy the experience and then sometimes use other tools. And of course, as you know, always when we have remote workshops, have remote things, there are always the risk of having like dif different technical issues during the workshop. So it's really important to be prepared for this, for the demo effect, so to say. Uh, we always have two facilitators in a workshop. Also, when we have these like face-to-face -face contact workshops, one to make sure that we might switch roles in the between, and the other one is sort of making sure that everything goes smoothly, writing down things, uh, making sure we have post-its, cutting paper, whatever is needed throughout the workshop. But also when we have like this remote workshop, it might sound like suddenly we need only one, but that's not true. It's good to have two workshop facilitators, just so you have like the one who can take care of the people while the other one is talking. So for example, support in technical issues. So if there's like nine participants in the workshop, but one is left outside, someone has to make sure that she can enter and, and sort of support that person while the other one is making sure they are, everyone else is in and has everything they need. And also have backup plans, have a second connection. For example, I often have my phone connection so that I can use that if my desktop so suddenly stops working and I have them in different internet connections also. So, so that makes sure that if one, for example, stops working, then I have the other one. So digital whiteboarding, what's that like? Uh, we have several tools for that, uh, really good tools, but uh, it's good to be extra prepared. For example, if you have a contact workshop, physical workshop where you participate, we have many times like these papers where you fill in things and when you do the tasks, they're like ready made canvases to fill in. And the same goes of course for digital workshops, remote workshops where we have the canvases ready made in the programs. Uh, prepare extra time for making these, of course. There are a lot of good templates available, but making sure that you have, have what you need for the workshop. But also extra time for the actual use of these canvases, because as I said earlier, the participants aren't very familiar with these tools. And us designers often are very like, aware of how to use digital tools like uh, anything graphical. But, but the participants aren't necessarily as especially if you involve end users, they're not used to these kind of tools. And we of course don't want them to not come to the workshop just because this becomes a hurdle. Uh, also, when we have like uh, contact workshops, I've noticed, or this is something probably many of you that have workshop have noticed, people have a tendency to sort of, when they write post-its notes, they don't want to show people what they're writing on the notes, unless when it's finished, then they show it. But sort of they want to hide away while they're working on it, that what do I write here, and perhaps throw away one post-it note and then write a new one. Or for example, when they're working on, on some idea, they might write several papers with a lot of extra ideas, but they don't want to show these to anyone. They hide them away and perhaps store them in their bag when they leave or, or somehow want to throw them in the bin. But so you have to allow space for like private and public output also throughout the workshop. So even if you go, uh, to a digital environment and we have a group like three people for example working on an idea they need a common platform where to work on that idea but something that not everyone will see that they can throw away when they're done so that only the finalized output is the one they will show to the rest of the people uh, but the, of course the positive side with these is that when they've actually done their idea it's ready in a digital digitalized format so this is really convenient actually using also these tools to sort of document and have everything in a digitalized format, even if you have a contact workshop or face-to-face -face workshop, what do you want to call them? Thank you, that was my part. Thank you, Yanni. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think 
there are a few takeaways that we'd like to briefly discuss um, before breaking into the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please use the, um, there is a, there is a Q&A section on the webinar tool. So, so feel free to uh, fire off questions there in English or Finnish and, uh, and we'll endeavor to, to answer them uh, straight after um, this. I think the main sort of takeaways um, from the webinar today is, is that, that you really need to um, ensure that, that you're building great digital experiences, uh, particularly at this time as, as the, the, the digital um, channels are, are hot and, and people are kind of reverting, reverting, reverting to digital channels for, for purchases and so on. Um, and there it's important that you put the, the customers in the heart of your business so that you are constantly collaborating and involving and iterating with your end users. And this will then also help you to set, set you up in a, in a completely new trajectory uh, when we are done with the crisis uh, and then you are much more prepared um, with your business. The second thing, of, of course, uh, around Lean Lab uh, is that it's a really smart way to connect with your end users and involve them seamlessly across the, the business. I think there the key is the systematic approach, uh, which is something that takes a little bit of time so that, that you can actually turn Lean Lab into something that is, is a process for your business where you Lean Lab with your customers across different initiatives uh, and areas of business. So it's not just owned by, let's say, a digital team, but it should be owned by the entire business and the staff. Because as we've seen, the, the leading companies that, that are winning the business, they live customer experience. It's in every employee's kind of mandate to, to understand customers and, and help, help the customers um, uh, you know, better experiences. And, and thirdly, on, on a Yenis um, section, uh, I think this could be also a sort of a competitive advantage for businesses that are launching into remote workshops. Um, and it's now the, the 11th hour, I would say, to, to, um, to build that capability and sustain that capability for running um, workshops remotely. Um, because it does help you to kind of lower the barrier for collaboration between your teams, particularly if they are um, uh, sitting in different countries in totally different locations. And once you kind of get hang of it, it does help you to speed up innovation because there is a lower barrier for people um, to be uh, collaborating with each other using digital tools. So I think those are the kind of th three takeaways that I like to put across uh, today from our webinar. Um, also, what I like to mention is that we are offering a pro bono Lean Lab program for for those companies and entities that are, are hit by Corona crisis. So please apply if you want to explore more, and we try to help you out. You can uh, send me an email there on the screen, or contact us otherwise through leanlab.co or digitalist.global website. Um, and just a, a last word on the future uh, webinars. We haven't got the date yet, sorry, but we are looking to do a panel discussion uh, with some of the leading uh, uh, players in the, in the different industries to talk about how they are navigating crisis and how, do they, how they are keeping the innovation and the co-creation flame on uh, despite of the, the, the challenges in the current business environment. I think we can now launch into uh, Q&A if there are any questions. You can use the Q&A um, button there on the webinar uh, software if you'd like to ask a question. If nothing else, um, in our last webinar there was a discussion on 
on the, the whiteboarding softwares, for example, how pricey those are. And to our experience, um, the, none of those softwares are really that expensive. They tend to be um, driven by the number of users. But if you, if you run a workshop for, for, let's say, a period of a week or two weeks and, and let the data sit there for, for a few days more, it won't end up costing you more than a few hundred euros or, or dollars. So, so using, using uh, digital remote workshop tools is not expensive. It's more about how do you then use them and, and how do you make, make the use simple and straightforward. Uh, if there are no questions from, uh, from you guys, I'd like to thank uh, on my and Jenny's behalf for attending the webinar and, uh, and wish you, um, uh, actually it's Easter, so I wish you a good Easter uh, in a few days time. Thank you very much. Bye.